I want to get into a little bit of his uh, concerns uh, pertaining to medical ethics, because mm -hmm. I think that's also something that is uh, unusually timely given our, our moment, which is uh, that Ivan Illich is often credited with sort of popularizing the idea of iatrogenics, that is uh, yeah. harm caused by medical professionals uh, that maybe otherwise uh, wouldn't have happened. Um, so it gets brought up that uh, iatrogenic harm is something like the third cause of, of, of you know, all mortality, uh, depending on who's counting and, and, and how you want to sort of um, calculate those statistics. But obviously with the uh, with the pandemic and, and, and the lockdowns and various measures that were taken, particularly uh, intubating people on, you know, um, <clears throat> breathing machines, uh, that proved to be pretty, pretty damaging for a lot of patients. And obviously different therapies and methods that we've learned since then have caused that to be sort of a, a tool of last resort. But I think that's a, a very prominent example, a recent example of iatrogenic harm, which Illich uh, originally pointed out. So do you want to just get into his sort of critique of the medical establishment here? Yeah, absolutely. And again, I would like to say that um, Illich revisits his thoughts later on, like there's a Lancet um, issue, like about 10 years after Limits to Medicine or Medical Nemesis um, has different titles, um, in which he kind of queries some of the, the claims that he makes or revises them slightly. And he kind of points out that, um, for example, health, has become yet another fetish, actually. So because in a way, in the earlier book, he's kind of opposing an idea of like uh, life and health to the, you know, iatrogenesis and the kind of medical cause harm and the, you know, the mass um, dosing of people, which has only increased, of course, when we're talking about anything from antidepressants to birth control to, you know, lifelong forms of medicalization, which are extremely, extremely dominant in the West. Um, that that actually you we have to be careful we don't just replace one um one kind of yeah institutional fetish with another right so that when and when he talks about then therefore that like the health industry and this idea of self-care and and how that it again has become kind of like uh, a new uh, new fetish object but to go back to the the kind of limits to medicine or medical nemesis um era um yes i mean I think there is very much, I would say, underlying his thoughts about um, about health and medicine is um, partly a sense of the tragic, which he thinks has also been lost so that that we increasing. And I think we've seen this in the pandemic where there's almost been a kind of neurotic breakdown at the idea of death and the idea of suffering and that the West has in a way become caught up in a kind of um, uh, almost like a hermetically sealed worship of health and security and safety for its own sake right at the expense of um, risk openness life and so on and this is something that david cayley has revisited in the in the during the pandemic very well like he thinks with illich about this and i think he's one of the few philosophers or thinkers that is actually um paying attention to what's going on i think philosophers and thinkers have in general been completely pathetic in terms of their response to the pandemic as if there's no time to think and that everyone's too scared and we can't ask any bigger questions about what it means that we've just imprisoned half the world for a year or, you know, that the, and it's still going. Of, yeah, exactly. I mean, like somehow people have stopped thinking, um, you know, I think the frequency of fear that has been generated has um, trapped a lot of minds. And yeah, in any case, so I suppose um, it's it's the question on fundamentally I suppose of of what kind of life do we want, you know? Do we want a life that is purely about preventing harm, you know? That does does everything to protect everyone from everything all the time, mm. you know? And that, that that no one is ever exposed to anything negative or bad, and you know, or anything that could upset them, you know? And and we've obviously seen these tendencies grow massively. Whether we're talking about exposure to language, exposure to other people, you know, other people's behavior, whatever, the, the, the normal stuff of life, yes. you know, and and so I think what Illich is trying to, to point to, I suppose, is, is another collective way of thinking about health, which which also takes it away from the individual, you know, the idea that there is, which is, again, very important when we're thinking about things like um, illnesses and pandemic and, and spreading and so on. But the emphasis can't just be on this idea of like the atomized individual for whom there is like a tailor made regimen 
of drugs or whatever. Um, you know, that, that health is a collective concern and, and it's related to questions of care and community. And, and it's often the case, as we know, that actually not intervening medically is often the best thing to do in many, many cases. You know, if you have a, you know, a, a medical system that is rewarded for intervention, right, mm. that gets money because it performs surgeries or gives people drugs, you know, and the whole big pharma question, um, then of course, doctors and all of these people, like you were talking about perverse incentives, well, they're not perverse, actually, from the standpoint of a capitalist economy, but incentives that basically say, if you perform more surgeries and get more people on drugs, you will be better rewarded, you know, of course, then that's what's going to happen. Whereas if you say, look, going outside and doing exercise and being in the sun and drinking water and eat eating healthily is yeah. basically going to stop the vast majority of people most of the time from getting very sick. And where they do, we can then help them. That's not pro very profitable. <laughs> yes, I think he's really pointing there to uh, sort of a sterilization, right, through, yeah. through, through the worship of sort of the health industrial complex, I'll call it. Um, and that, you know what is sterilization at its core it's lifelessness and yep. really what we're doing is we're sacrificing again as you alluded to the the aspects of of living right of of being together of you know socially interacting for example with yeah. other humans in close proximity uh if what you're doing is you're staying alive longer and but but through that staying alive longer you're doing less of the things that life is about then it becomes a question of like well what kind of life are we preserving here um, exactly. And, you know, you can live in a, a, a bubble if you want, like, like a literal bubble. Like um, I, I know there's the, the bubble boy famous for having some sort of immunological condition. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's it's like if we're all just going to trap ourselves in our apartments and never go outside again. Uh, and that's sort of we're extending life. Then you, it, it does become a question of like, what exactly are we doing? Well, yeah. And also the, the, the point is that that won't actually extend your life. You'll become sick. You know, if you yeah. don't go outside and right. go in the sun and, you know, actually it does make you sick. I mean, you know, like one of the things I was just writing about this morning is like, you know, the, the so in the UK, but elsewhere, I guess the pattern would be the same. If you are obese, you're you suffer from COVID much worse. Right. It, it massively increases your chances of, of not surviving COVID. Right. And so then you would think that prevention is better than a cure and, and that the government should be investing all its money and basically trying to get people to lose weight and encourage them and go outside. And but no, you know, we have the opposite encourage, which is like stay indoors and order takeaway, you know, like that's the dominant <laughs> culture. And some uh, person who's being paid like three pound fifty an hour will deliver you your pizza. I mean, like, you know, of course, so, so of course, it's again, like the institutions are not even doing what they say they are supposed to do. Like, you know, the government is not pre pre preserving your life. It's not prolonging anything. It's it's, you know, actively destroying your health. Um, mm. And I think when people realize that their health belongs to them in the first place and not to the state, this is like a major breakthrough, I think, you know, um, and I guess you can see a lot your, your health isn't a public good. <laughs> it's a private good. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So it's like our obsession with public health is sort of like everyone's health becomes someone else's concern and uh it's all it's chiefly your concern <laughs> yeah exactly and and you know and that but that's also a social good i mean if you are if you if you've you know if you're not addicted if you're not um eating badly and if you're in a good mental and physical state you are much better able to look after yourself and also look after other people right you know so there is a social it's not selfish to you know, be healthy. In fact, it's good, better for everyone. It's completely upbuilding and social, but that's the opposite of the image of health. Yeah, that's almost like um, derogated or delegated to the state somehow. Yes.